So today we're checking in with Quincy City Council President Nina Liang to chat about uh, what was the uh, last City Council meeting of uh, the year. And also, uh, Nina, the last one for you as Council President. So I thought it was kind of emotional, too. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for checking in with us from uh, on the road. <laughs> but yes. I appreciate you you'd taking the time out to uh, to talk with us and certainly want to talk a little bit about your feelings about uh, the last meeting. But before we do that, we have to talk business, right? Yes. Yes. OK, so it was all about and as typically is the last meeting of the year, the property tax um, rate. So how'd that go? Yeah, it was uh, it was really informative, as it always is. Uh, we have Ms. Colin Haley, who is the city assessor, come in to give a presentation about you know, how the tax rate is set, to give some updates about some numbers as far as you know, the sales of homes went, you know, sort of what the increase in the commercial tax base was. And it's, again, at the end of the day, the way the tax rate is set, it's, it's all, it's an equation, right? It's math, you can't just make these things up. And so um, it's always really helpful and really informative to have her come in and explain sort of from beginning to end how they arrived at the number that they arrived at. And so um, it was a really, Again, informal conversation, we had a public hearing at the beginning of it so residents could weigh in. Um, you know, the presentation was submitted through the council agenda last week, and so folks had time to review it if they wanted to, um, to come to the council to give any other comments around it. Yeah, uh, speaking with the mayor earlier this week about it, and the average residential increase is about $230. Um, how do you feel about that? Not good. You know, I don't, th- I don't think any of us feel good about it, you know. Um, at the end of the day, it's an increase, right? It's an increase to, to all of our pockets that we have to navigate in, in the coming year and, you know, how we're going to figure out how we're going to pay for that increase. Um, it's, it's never it's never an easy conversation to have, right? And all of us on the council, we're all impacted by it as well. And, you know, the thing is, is that the, the great thing about it is that the rate continues to go down, which is, is wonderful, right? So the tax rate itself is what is the rate you're being charged for $1,000 of value on your home, you know? And so let's say your home is $200,000, how much are you being charged per $1,000 of that $200,000? And that equals your tax bill for the year, right? So the rate last year was you know, a little over $12. Now it's under 12, right? And so that sounds wonderful. However, I'm not taxing you on $200,000 anymore. I'm taxing you on 250, 300, right? And so even though the rate is lower, the assessed value of your home has gone up and continues to go up. Um, again, the, the upside to that is that it's a reflection on, I think, what has happened in the city, right? And the growth and the progression that we've seen in the city, right? With, you know, new and beautiful parks, the schools that we're seeing, I mean, Squantum schools and school is going to be built as well with support of the state. But it, it's sort of like a, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? You have to sort of look at it and think, okay, well, there's all these improvements that are happening here in the city. So it's a wonderful thing. And the taxes um, reflect that because again, now the value of your home is a lot more valuable than it was 10 years ago, you know? And so, it's, it, that's a wonderful thing to look at. Again, the opposite of that, though, and that was, you know, why I had the reaction I did when we first started this conversation, which is that it sucks, is, excuse my language, but it's because a lot of people can't afford to stay here to, to reap those benefits, right? I mean, I've been doing this now, and you'd mentioned this is the end of my, my council presidency term. It's, it's been six years, though, that I served in the council. And there are people who I've spoken to when I first started this to now who no longer live in Quincy, right? They've sold their home or they've left because they can't afford the rents here. And so it's a wonderful thing, the things that are happening here, but it's a yes and situation, I believe, right? Yes, these great things are happening. And we need to make sure that the people that have been here through, you know, all of those, those changes and through all that growth can actually stay here to benefit from that, you know? And I think that's something that we're still struggling with right now. Yeah, I know um, Councillor Andronico, I believe, um, has a proposal to kind of allow for a residential exemption. Do you know where that stands? Yeah, that's something that um, I'm actually really grateful for his support on. It's something that I've been, you know, a dog on a bone with for, for quite some time, along with Councillor Pamucci. And so I'm super excited to have the help and the sort of knowledge that Councillor Andronico um, it brings to the conversation, right, to sort of revive that, because it it's something that we've wanted for quite some time now. And again, you know, when I spoken earlier about setting the tax rate, it's a, it's an equation, right? We can't just go in and say, we're just going to make up this number and give you an exemption. There's currently, by the way, um, and this is important. I hope folks will, will dig into this and and find out if they're um, eligible for any of these exemptions. There's currently 19 different exemptions um, in existence right now that the assessor's office helps residents with. um, And on top of those exemptions, you know, folks can also take advantage of any sort of deferring deferrals uh, for their payments as well, if they need to. Um, but back to the sort of 
overarching conversation that we've been having around the, the residential tax exemption, right? The state of Massachusetts allows for, if you live in the home that you own, right? Allows for up to 35% off the assessed value of your home, right? And so again, if you are, you know, if your home is, hundred, it's not this much, but we're just talking, you know, just for yeah, conversation sake, sure. right? If your home is valued at um a hundred thousand dollars and you live in that home, you actually don't get taxed on the full hundred thousand. You can apply and say, I actually live in the home that I own. So I'm going to apply up to the full max of 35% off the value of that home. And you get taxed on that lesser percent, right? Like okay. you don't get taxed on the full hundred thousand. And so that's great. That, that's, that's wonderful for all those people who actually live in the home that they own here in the city. The problem is, is that if we do that, well, then now you have a chunk of money to pay for city services that are gone. Right. Right. To pay for the school buses to take kids to school, to pay for our firefighters, right? To, to save us in case of a fire. I mean, like to fix our roads, right? Now there's a huge chunk of money that's that's gone, you know? And we already tax the commercial base to the max, right? The way we set the tax rate, which is also part of the conversation we had last night, is we can look and say, okay, you know, we have to pay for all these services. So we look at the commercial, we look at residential, we look at all of that and say, you need to come up with X amount of dollars. You know, you can look and say, we're going to split that 50-50 between commercial and residential, or we actually have the ability to say, no, we're going to tax commercial more and residential less, right? Which is what we do. We've done that every year for as long as I've ever been here, right? Certainly before then as well. We can't increase that anymore. I, I can't go back to you as a, you know, commercial uh, business owner, whatever it may be, and say, okay, I'm going to tax you more because I want to give residents an exemption. You, you can't just do that. There is there is a legal equation behind mm-hmm. all of it, if, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. And so yeah. what we need to do, all that being said, is find a way to get creative to make up those funds elsewhere, right? We already tax commercial to the max. We tax residents right here. But if we create this gap to give residents an exemption who live in their home, well, now how are we going to make up this chunk of money, right? Where are we going to find that funding source? And I think that someone somewhere down the line, a legislator somewhere came up with the idea of a residential exemption. Somebody came up with an idea of splitting the tax rate. Um, Somebody somewhere has the answer on how we can do this. And again, I, I think with the support of my colleagues um, and working in collaboration with them um, and a number of folks actually in the community, residents have reached out to give some ideas on how we can move forward on this as well. There's, there's an answer somewhere out there, right? And we don't have to come out swinging and say, we're going to give a full 35%, you know, exemption. We can start with something. So I don't, we start with half a percent. It's something is better than nothing. Right. And so um, again, you know, the assessor's office has been exceptionally helpful in, in helping me to, in educating me, right. Helping me understand um, how this process works and in the hopes that if I understand the process, we can try to find a solution. So shout out to them. I, I know that again, we have incredibly intelligent, well-educated folks um, who again, residents and my colleagues alike uh, who are trying to find a viable, you know, a viable solution for this. So hopefully we'll, we'll figure something out in this coming term, but it's definitely something that I want to, I want to make sure we get done. Okay. Uh, but in the short term, as you mentioned, um, you know, 19 different opportunities for uh, uh, relief. So folks should really reach out to the assessor's office if they're having difficulty and see if they qualify for some of those, right? They should. They should. And, and just um, a couple of things, I think for me anyways, I am, um, you know, wasn't, uh, I think, fully aware of this process when I was trying to help my parents out with certain things on looking at the assessed values of their home. And so it's really interesting, the, um, the amount of resources you can actually find through the assessor's office. I encourage folks to go on their website. You can actually look, take a look at the presentation um, that we received on our end, a sort of summary of everything that was presented to uh, sort of explain how we got to where we are with the tax rate this coming year. There's a full booklet on again, the specifics of how you get to the tax rate that's set every single year. Uh, There's information about those current tax exemptions that are available for residents. There's information about deferments if folks need to defer their payments and and figure something. I mean, it's the assessor's office is there to help you, right? Um, And so I really do encourage folks, if they have any questions whatsoever, to please reach out to them. They're always accessible, um, always super helpful. And again, just brilliant people um, all around. I, I've learned a lot from them and I think it's really helpful for folks to understand as well how we've gotten to the numbers where we've gotten to. Yeah, it's, you know, it's important. Don't, uh, folks should reach out for help. Don't let yourself get into a situation um, where you're in serious debt, you know, uh, try and uh, try and address that before that happens. Mm-hmm. 
And there was also a couple of ordinances I see on the agenda, Nina. Yes, uh, two orders that were discussed last night. Also, uh, Chairwoman Mahoney, who's chairwoman of ordinance, um, held a public meeting at the beginning of the meeting just so that folks, again, you know, the public can come and weigh in if they had um, any thoughts about the two orders that were in front of us. So I'll just go in a sort of sequence of what was being discussed. So the first one uh, was an ordinance that was introduced by Councilor Pabucci, and it's to essentially create some structure for how folks can use public spaces, right? Public spaces, you know, owned by the city. Um, by the taxpayers and uh, this one specifically talking about um the new open space has been created in the downtown in the development district right so in front of city hall kilroy square you know these are for those who haven't been down to either of those two areas i encourage them to check it out um recently there's been a bunch of events happening around there which is wonderful right uh, but we do want to make sure that while folks um this order basically is saying that while folks certainly have the freedom to gather wherever they'd like it's public space you know we just want to be mindful and intentional about the fact that if you know organizations or businesses or whoever it is if they're coming into those spaces and taking over or utilizing that space um, as a business essentially and profiting off of it right there's liability that comes with that there's safety that comes with that um there's notice that comes with that right so this order essentially creates a structure to say you know if you are any sort of company that's coming in to use a public space for profit, you know, we need to make sure that there's a process for you to notify the city. We need to make sure that you're properly insured in case of any injuries, right? So that the city's not liable for any of that, um, which is helpful, right? I, this is, again, it's a brand new space. It, it's something new that the city is dealing with. And so this order reflects that, right? It's sort of saying, okay, we know that the space is here now. We encourage folks to use it absolutely, but let's set up a process so everyone knows how to use the space properly if they need to. Okay, so that, that was approved. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. Other uh, fees attached to that, Nina? Uh, so as of right now, it's it's really up to the administration, right? I mean, the administration okay. today is the, the mayor is the CEO of the city. And so a lot of that is at their discretion of, you know, what that looks like. And again, I think it just depends on also, for me anyways, I, I view it as, you know, what kind of business is coming in here, right? If somebody's coming in and again, they're, they're, they're using it as a way to generate revenue for their own private company. Okay. But this is a public space, you know, and, and public use mm -hmm. is the most important. And that comes first and foremost. I believe the fees will reflect that. Okay. All right. Excellent. Uh, and then uh, something uh, uh, regarding building uh, construction methods. Yes. Um, so this is a really interesting conversation. I just want to give a shout out to our council for um, his sort of work and thought around this. You know, it was a really robust conversation, one that was also had a planning board to discuss as well, because when it was originally introduced, it was introduced as a change to zoning, right? And zoning impacts again how buildings are built. And, and this impacted that, right? It was essentially this comes from my understanding a place where there's so much development happening right now, yes, but a lot of this development is different than how it was way back when, right? There's a lot of structures being built that, you know, are, are sort of those um, those units being built off site. It's kind of like Jenga, where you come and you just stack them in the buildings. And, you know, it's the way that things are being built are just different, right? And the higher we go, obviously, the more liability there is and, and God forbid something happening, right? People getting injured. Now, specifically, though, when it comes to um, the safety of our firefighters, we need to be mindful and intentional about what we're doing to make sure that they're being safe when it comes to these new buildings, right? So some of the things that were being proposed were, well, we need to make sure that there's certain requirements for um, the space in between each of the units in between the walls, right? And just, you know, that's what happens, right? You create more space, there's, you know, it takes longer for the fire to sort of move between the different rooms and hopefully gives more time for firefighters and people to get out of the building, right? Um, the second was, you know, uh, providing a fire watch, right? When these buildings are being built or maybe when they're standalone, but they're not done yet, there's still the structure is there, right? There's still always going to be a risk of the structure of God forbid to catch on fire. And so making sure that there's a fire watch, that somebody is on site, God forbid something like that does happen. And the third is putting um, something on the facade of the building, just a, a you know, a, a plaque that is not large whatsoever, just to, um, you know, note what the structure is made out of so that when, again, God forbid there's a fire, firefighters are coming up to that building, they can look and say, okay, well, this looks like it's brick, but is it really, you know, what, what is behind that brick? And it's helpful. It's super helpful to know um, for them to understand, okay, how much time do I have to get folks in and out of this building? And mm -hmm. what's the structural integrity of this place, right? It's, 
it's very important for them to know what's behind the walls that you're just seeing, you know, when you approach a building. And so, you know, it's, it's very specific, very detailed things, but changing those obviously impacts significantly how things are being built and how the development process works. And so um, that does impact zoning changes as well. And unfortunately, and, and looking back at, at some of the information that was provided last night, you know, we cannot supersede some of the state zoning requirements that are, are passed along to us, right? And, and we have very intelligent folks um, in special services with Jay Duca, um, with his leadership, we have folks in the zoning department as well. So it's just, you know, as far as those items go, I believe that there are already things in place um, that can ensure that those things are being, you know, examined and reviewed, right? For us, the most important thing is always going to be the safety of our first responders and just looking at the fact that, okay, having a plaque on the front of a building, there's plaques on the front of tons of buildings, right? Like Council Mahoney mentioned, there's LEED certified buildings with a plaque that says LEED, right? There's plaques on the front of buildings that say dedicated to, right? The year it was built, right? Uh, for notoriety, whatever it may be. And plaques don't impact um, any changes to the cost of or structures of development. It's, it's simply a plaque that's put on the front of a building. And so at the very least, you know, because this is such a, a much, I think, broader conversation, we can certainly follow up on later on. We wanted to make sure to get something passed that could, you know, move this in the right direction, right? Like, what are we doing to make sure that a lot of these new buildings that are being built um, are done so in such a way that makes it a lot easier for our first responders to come and save us, God forbid, if there's a need to do so. Hmm. Okay. So, so did that get approved? It did. Mm -hmm. Does that need state approval too? No. Mm -mm. The way it's currently listed right now, no. Because again, it's, it's simply saying, hey, if there are these buildings that are being built, let's put a plaque on the front of it that explains what the structure is made out of inside and out. Um, and that doesn't change, you know, again, how large a building is. It doesn't change what the color of the building is. It doesn't change what the building is made out of. It, it's simply something that notes for these firefighters. Okay, this is what the structure is made out of. So, Okay. Now, is that for all new buildings going forward or is that for existing buildings? That's, that's the hope, right? Is that um, any of these new structures that are going up? Because again, you know, there's still... Um, new development coming in the downtown. There's new development, I think, happening across the city where we're seeing larger buildings go up as well. And so moving forward, the hope is, is that these plaques are going to be put up on those buildings. Okay, but not not existing buildings? Not to my knowledge. Mm -mm. Okay, interesting. Okay, I'm um, assuming that the firefighters supported that? Yes, they did. Yeah, I actually do want to um, think the chief came out as well um, to, to speak on it last night during the public hearing. We had Tom Bose, who's head of the local 792 union come out and speak on it. A number of firefighters actually, um, former and current, had, had sent in emails to explain why they want to support this as well. And so it's, look, I'm not a firefighter. So at the end of the day, it's always really helpful um, to hear from them, right? People who are on the front lines every day and hear their firsthand experience. Um, and they're the ones that, you know, are doing this job day in and day out. So they know best what is going to keep them safe. Um, and it's helpful to hear that from them and to learn that about them. Yeah, very good. Curious, Nia, just a question um, with regard to the taxes. Uh, as you're well aware, earlier this year, the uh, city council bonded the $475 million for the city's pension obligations. Did that have the desired effect to keep the tax increase lower? Um, I want to say yes, we should actually know today, uh, or no, yeah, we should, we should know by now. Um, so we had the discussion on Monday, they were looking to finalize everything yesterday, as far as what the rate was going to look like for that, um, for that payment. And so ideally, yes, you know, that's the intent okay. is that we were going to be saving a significant amount of money. Um, we should know by now. So hopefully we'll have that update and I'm sure the mayor will speak about it as well this week. Okay. We'll check back in with him on that. Uh, anything else of note, uh, from the meeting? look through the agenda and see. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think the biggest thing was um, talking about the tax rate. And again, I, I really do encourage folks to, to take a look um, at the assessor's website and, and look at those opportunities for, for exemptions, right? Again, there's 19 opportunities that currently exist. Please know that we are working on more. There's a lot of people that, even though there are 19 exemptions for residents here in the city for their taxes, a lot of folks don't qualify for those 19 either, right? And we need to look out for them as well. And so this is an ongoing effort. Um, I think that, you know, the, again, the increase in assessed values of our properties are a reflection of the growth of the city, but, you know, moving forward, um, you know, I know it's a priority of mine and certainly a number of my colleagues that we need to make sure that 
people who have been here, right? Residents and business owners alike can continue to stay here to benefit from those things. And unfortunately, it's not happening for a lot of folks right now. Um, so it's, I think it's a yes and, right? Yes, things are amazing here in the city. And let's make sure that folks who have built this city can continue to stay here and benefit from it. All right. Very good. Good advice and, uh, and good guidance for sure for folks. It was, uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of this, your last uh, meeting as city council president. Uh, you certainly, you know, easily reelected to another two year term. So we'll still see you on the council. But uh, what are you feeling now after uh, serving two years as president? Um, it's, it's bittersweet, I think, you know, um, I mean, all of us started 2020 with very different goals in mind than how we ended, right? And how we've had to shift goals um, along the way. But, you know, I, I think that the timing of it worked out really well. Um, you know, that I was able to uh, be the council president throughout the pandemic. You know, I um, I leaned very heavily on a lot of folks in the council office, right? Nicole Crispo, Jennifer Manning, Susan O'Connor, um, Kathy Noonan, and I mean, they, they they were all super helpful in making sure that things were seamless for us when we couldn't be in person, right? And a lot of this work was so much of those in-person interactions that I don't think we could have done it without them keeping the ship, you know, running and keeping the trains running on time and all of that. So I'm super grateful for, for their help and for their support. Um, you know, and to my colleagues as well. I mean, we all had to be really flexible in our own personal lives and professional lives, but we also had to make sure that we we're still prioritizing this work in a space that was uncharted for all of us, right? And I don't think I could have done it for the last two years with committee meetings and public hearings and community meetings and talking about development and showing up to planning board and zoning board and testifying at those things and creating these kinds of spaces for department heads to come and do presentations. I mean, like all of it, right? Like I, it was with the partnership um, and leadership, I think of my fellow colleagues that I was able to do this. And so I'm very grateful for their help with that. I don't think I could have done it without them. Um, and of course, all of you at QATV, right? I actually just met with QATV. We, we sat down with them yesterday in the chamber, um, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday in the chamber to talk about options for, you know, hybrid participation, right? Um, uninterrupted hybrid participation. It's just, it takes a village, right? And um, I'm very much that kind of person. You know, I think over the last six years, people have come to know that about me. I'm all about collaborative efforts. You know, we can't do this alone. And these last two years, I think was a prime example of that, right? It, it really was you, Jonathan, Mark, right? Everyone in the council office, everyone in the mayor's office, even department heads, um, and more importantly, my colleagues, right? Who all came together to make these last two years possible. I mean, the fact of the matter is we were able to keep government running in a virtual space through a pandemic for the last two years. You know, we vaccinated a thousand seniors. We've created our own, you know, vaccine registration website. We supported small businesses. We've, you know, it, We've helped uh, so many nonprofits, right? Like support those in the uh, in the community and help residents. I mean, it's it's been an incredible coming together of the community during a very difficult, very challenging time. These last two years, in addition to the pandemic, I think were difficult for for so many reasons, right? Discussions around equity and race, and and you know how does that impact us, and how do we deal with that? How do we respond to that? I, there were incredibly challenging things put in front of us that we all had to step up and be leaders in our community for. Um, we didn't do that alone, but we did it, right? We did it because we connected with the community. We did it because we worked with one another, even if we disagreed on things. There were plenty of times you can look back during these last two years um, where there are really heated conversations because we're so passionate about what we do, right? Um, but we all came through it together, you know, and I think we're all better off for it. And so I'm exceptionally proud um, and, and deeply, deeply grateful for everyone's support around this work. And, and you know, happy to move on and get back to work outside of the council presidency for sure. Yeah, that's what I'm going to ask you next is what, you know, what, what didn't you get accomplished that you'd like to still continue to work on? Yeah, I mean, so again, last year, in, in the beginning of 2020, when I came in, um, you know, with this, you know, idea that we were going to do amazing things because pandemic, what is that, right? And so, uh, you know, I get the residential tax exemption is, is a drum that I've been beating for quite some time. I, I do still want to focus very specifically on that. Um, and try to find a solution that will work, or at least to start a good solution that will work, right? And then I also had talked a lot about a mobility plan, and, and we're moving in that direction, right? The mayor had proposed um, the start of some changes to our zoning code, and that's really important. I talked earlier about the affordability of the city. We talked about buildings and where they're going up, right? That all comes back to essentially our zoning code, right? What you can build and where you can build it. Um, and the key, I believe, to that is access, right? And making sure that that 
is something that we're being really intentional about when we're, when we're building in certain areas in certain neighborhoods, right? What is, what is, what are the traffic patterns in that area? Right, what's the access to public transportation in that area? And that reflects back to affordability, but also equity as well, right? And, and so those two things are something that I was really excited about. Um, certainly work towards those things were, were being done the last two years, but now we, I believe we can sort of shift focus and say, okay, let's get back to, you know, making sure that we're, we're making real strides on those things. Okay. Your um, advice for the next council president, Nina, I know I've asked you this before, but what would your, what would your, uh, sage advice to that person be? Hmm. I, I still go back to um, what I had said when we first spoke about this, listen, right? Uh, listen, like listen to those who served before, listen to those who are active in the community, listen, you know, to your colleagues, um, to those in the council office, right? It's, it's, it's a, it gets to be a sponge, right? Um, and I think to that end, maybe the second thing I would say is, you know, be flexible. You know, you have to clearly be flexible. I mean, again, I started thinking here we are in 2020 in January and we're going to have all these amazing things we're going to do. Um, and every step of the way we've had to be flexible, right? When we were first in, in the Zoom space, you know, you know, you and I spoke about this. We were like, all right, Joe and May will be back in person. And here we are two years later, right? And so, you really had to be flexible. Um, but I think what, what helped me and what drove a lot of my decisions is, is really listening, right? And, and taking that feedback and guidance um, from those around me who helped us to make those decisions along the way and um, to help us move forward successfully. So those two things, listen uh, and be flexible for sure. Okay. Um, what is the schedule now for the council going forward? Do you know what, when the first meeting of the new year is? Is it right on January 3rd? It is. Um, so it's the swearing in necessarily, right? Okay. It, it's a council meeting. Sure, it's the first meeting of the year, but it, it acts as a swearing in ceremony. So it'll be a formal uh, swearing in ceremony. And, you know, we don't, we don't skip a beat. There's no like, you know, winter break or anything like that, right? We just, between December and January, we're going right through the process. We're not stopping. Okay. So, um, I mean, certainly, I know you won't be council president anymore, but you're certainly welcome to uh, bring uh, updates here to QATV uh, Whenever you feel like it, Nina, we'd happy. To I have. love that. Yeah, I really enjoyed this, and so I think that's another chance for sweet. It's like, oh, I don't, I can't bug Joe every other week anymore, but I can still bug you. We'll find, we'll find things to talk about, Joe, for sure. <laughs> it's not a bug at all. It's our, it's our pleasure. That's part of our mission here too, is to connect the community um, with its elected officials. So please continue to use us to do that, and thank you for doing it. And to you and your family and your colleagues, a very happy, healthy uh, holiday season. You too, Joe. Thank you so much again for, for these last two years. It's been uh, really a pleasure chatting with you. And, and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to continuing working together. So thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for getting our, our work out there to residents and connecting us to folks. And yeah, happy holidays to you as well.